talking today, Fraser Fair, a uh, noted artist, uh, Melbourneian and client and friend of Leonard Joel. And uh, this um, Leonard TV presentation is part of Design Ic Icons Week. We have a wonderful prints and multiples auction that is coming up. And uh, this uh, interview with Fraser Fair, this in conversation, really stemmed from a brief discussion Fraser and I had at our centenary party last year. And right. it also stems from a, a small painting I sold, a portrait of Andy Warhol many years ago, um, and a, a beguiling little portrait. And I asked Fraser Fair that night, did he paint that from an image or did he paint it with the city there? And uh, to my absolute surprise, Fraser said to me, well, I painted Andy Warhol as a sitter. And that's where the story began. And um, with that said, I'll, I'll hand it over to Fraser. And, and I guess my, my first question is, Fraser, is how did you get to Andy Warhol in the first place? Well, I, I, I was just visiting New York. And I was in, I think, Union Square, where he had his old studio, which is where he'd been for a long time. And I just walked past his studio and the door was open and I thought, oh, well, I may as well go up, I'm a tourist. And so I went up and surprising, there was no, no security and I just walked in and there he was on the floor working on some silk, big silk screen prints. And so I, was, I just went up to him and said, oh, I'm, I'm an admirer of your work. And, and he looked up and said, oh, I mean, he immediately knew my accent. I said, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Australia. And he said, isn't that nine days flying away from here? You know, he had no idea, but he just knew Australia was the end of the earth. And that somewhere. was probably a little bit rough because it, was that in the early 1980s or late 70s? Early 80s. So yeah, it wouldn't have taken nine days, but no, I, I, I take the only point. Took, you know, 18 hours or 20 hours or whatever it was. Anyway, so um, he just stood up and we began talking and he wanted to know a bit about Australia and he showed me around the studio and uh, I think at that time he had um, Nancy Reagan's daughter working for him. And so one end of the studio he had the high and the other end the, uh, you know, the kind of more, not disreputable, but the more risque sort of people because uh, he, he liked to combi uh, combine them. And he'd actually employed at one stage one of the Manson girls. And I think she was just out on bail or between crimes or whatever it was. And so I, got, I, I just met them briefly and I just watched him working with his silk screens. And I was surprised he was quite hands on then. And those big silk screens on the floor and he had those big squeegees and he squeezed the colour through. And so we just got talking and then. Um, he asked me about Australia and and uh, I said, oh, you're very interested in um, the disaster themes. And then he said to me, oh, um, I read something about lots of shark attacks in Australia. And um, so he then turned to me and said, did you ever see one? Did you ever see a shark attack? And luckily I had. <laughs> Lucky <But> you had. <laughs> Luckily, I had, and it was a. Um, it, was it was when I was a kid, and we were up at this out of the way place called Yapoon, which is mainly mud flats and mangrove, not the ideal Queensland site, but it was quiet, and Mum wouldn't let us swim there, so we just went to the beach in the little hotel we stayed at had a pool. Anyway, we were all sitting on the beach, and it was only us and a, and a, a lady with a little pooch, a little fluffy dog and she was throwing the ball and it would bounce into the water, punt the ball back to the beach and she'd do it again and again. And then my, my mum, who was a professional fisherman, just suddenly stood up and, and shouted at the woman, I think there's a shark near your dog. And the next minute we, we heard the yapping and all of a sudden, blop, it was, the little dog was gone and the ball was just floating there. And, and then a second later, a fin, quite a big fin, just popped up nearby. And yeah. she informed the lady, I think your dog's been taken. And oh, it was terrible. We had to take her back to the motel and buy a four gin and tonics and poor thing. And anyway, I told Andy the story and he was 
just love it. He wanted to, get, to go through the details of what was the splash like when it actually happened. And, and then he said to me, and was it a cute dog? I he asked you, was it a cute dog? Was it a cute dog? And I said, yes, very, very cute. And he said, oh, I, I must make a trip to Australia. And did he ever travel? He never travelled to Australia, did he? Australia? No, he didn't, but he was planning to. Mm. But unfortunately, you know, mm. he died. Because he'd, he, he'd, he'd lined up some portraits mm. to do here. With, with a, quite a lot of Australians lived in New York mm. and moved around the art scene. And so he was going to do it, I think, in, in 88. Mm. Actually, come over here. Yeah, actually, come over for here for a holiday or for commissions. Or oh, like for commissions and and yeah. a holiday. Because I remember seeing portraits of Lottie and Victor Smorgan that's by right. Andy Warhol. That's right. So they would have travelled to him for those sittings. That, so that's right. Am I right in saying some Australians did did sort of go over there? That's right. It was got the invitation or could, or could yes, could or the, get they, they the were there because any, anyone could. Uh, you could go to Andy, and I think at the time a portrait was. 25,000. Right. This is in 84, 85. And uh, I thought about it and I wished I had. Mm. Because he usually did them, when, when, he did, when he did the portrait, he usually did a set of four, like a repeated I image. I read that, yeah. So that's, that's what he did. Anyway, one day I watched him um, show how it was done. Mm. And it was, he had a, one of those Polaroid cameras that had took four pictures at once. These are the very white. sort of box-like cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were quite, they were very good on black and white. The detail was very good. Right. That's all he wanted. But he, he'd make them sit, uh, sit there in a chair or standing and he'd cover their face completely with a white, um, like a white makeup mask, white. Mm. So all you could see is, was dots of the eyes, dots of the nostrils, the mouth and the hairline. To create this sort of very extreme sort of it's just just this flat face, effect, which then yeah. he'd uh, put layers of colour yeah. on, and you know the effect was wonderful. Mm. So I remember seeing those portraits. portraits. I think they're, they're lovely, impressive things. portraits. Lovely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you, but the next time you look at them, you can see. You can see how to, how he's done it so perfectly with the white mask, so you just get the eyes, the nose, and he would do that with all his sitters. All of them. They had to do that. Them. Yeah, that, that's right. Because he really wanted to make the face was really a canvas for him. Mm. You know, he liked to make art like manufacturing, mm. like commercial manufacturing. There was that no was sort of embarrassment of about production. No, no, not, no, 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 none at all. Yeah. And he yeah. had lots of helpers and experts mm. that helped him. Yeah. But he basically did the, you know, just was in charge of the whole mm. creative process. Mm. But he was inspired by um, oh, the late works of Matisse, where he just used patches of colour glued onto each other. It was Matisse got up Which is right. that sort of effect you get with the Mick Jagger one. That that's right, correct. It almost well, looks like right. a, a patchwork. That, that, yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. Matisse invented that sort of technique of mm. sliding pieces of colour mm. uh, at the end of his life mm. because he couldn't paint anymore because he had arthritis. Mm. And, um, but basically, I, I remember his house on the second floor it was a whole room was just devoted to found objects, plastic dollies, wrappers, a anything manufactured, anything mm. from the commercial world that appealed to him. That he would, that he found himself. I mean, in his, oh, in yeah, his mainly, it, was, it was all mainly stuff that he'd found, mm. and it was like his source material. Mm. Mm. And um, he was obsessed with that, all all that that sort of world. What I realised, he was very. Um, he loved to hear tales and stories from anyone he met. Mm. And he was a bit like, um, he reminded me of that famous writer, Somerset Maugham, who just lived vicariously. You know, the sort of people, like, they stay at home, mm. but they love to be fed mm. stories and experiences mm. by other people. And live for everyone. Th th they live through other people. And mm. that's, that's what Warhol was mm. like. Mm. He sort of lived through the experiences of other people. Mm. And it, you know, I told him the story about the shark attack, and two years later, he, he just repeated it back to me verbatim. Two years later? Yeah, yeah. two years later. He never forgot anything. Yeah. So you visited him memory. again in New York, did you? Yeah, f quite a few times, yeah. yeah. And um, he always had interesting people. Mm. Just from your point of view, where does Warhol sit 
in sort of modern contemporary art and how important or well, I think overrated he's, yeah. or underrated? Uh, well, I think, I, think he's, I think he's very important. Mm. He, was, he was the one that really focused on the whole idea of pop art. Mm. And pop art is basically uh, um, an undisguised expression of the industrial process. Mm. And that all the images made by the industrial process are, are as good as art, are the same mm. as great art mm. in the 20th century. Mm. That's how he saw it. Mm. You know, he, he, tried to, he tried to alert people to the fact that they live in this banal world, but in fact the banality is brilliant. Mm. visually, mm. which I completely agree with. Mm. And um, that's what and I think it, he was one that drew it all together. Mm. He was the first one to draw it all together. Because mm. there were other pop artists at the time who were all, there was Rosenquist and um, Lichtenstein and mm. of the whole. But I guess no one got, but no I think one Andy sort of got everyone talking about it in a way that no one else could. Correct, that's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Fraser, before we let you go, and you mentioned his relationship and you many other artists, and, and Keith Haring is another artist that's in our um, forthcoming collection. And I understand that you knew Keith Haring and met him and spent time. Did, did you meet him through met him Andy here. Warhol? No, I met him here. So quite separately? Quite, quite separately. And I met him because I, I was involved mainly as a sort of patron and a friend of the Contemporary Art Society, mm. which started in the Domain, didn't it? As a, they had this Victorian house at the Domain, which was renovated. Mm. And I think the Smallmans put up the money and it was redone as a very smart right. contemporary art gallery, but it was on a relatively small, there was, there was nothing uh, of the equivalent in Melbourne. Mm. Is this the one opposite the Botanical Garden? Oh, that's right, correct. The main? That's right. So it over actually the herbarium overlooks correct. the building. Correct, that's right. Beautiful space. It yeah. is. It yeah. I, I don't know what they use it for now. Mm. And did Keith Haring hey, well, he sh well, he, sh he showed there when right. he came out, along with a whole a number of other artists that came out. Yeah. And you met him there? Uh, well, I, I, I met him there. Yeah. And he came and stayed at our house for three nights right. when he first arrived. Mm. And, um, and he knew Warhol too, though. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, it was very nice. It was, mm. you know, and you know, we, we racked our brains to try and think of to show him something really Australian. So we took him down to visit s some people I know who live in this big old house and property in the Western District. Oh. And the house is like the house of Usher. It's totally unkept, and there are crunchy blowflies on the floor. Mm. The people that own sort it. Of it's been like that for almost a century. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And the the, 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 the chap that owns it's eccentric. Yeah. But he's very interested in the arts. So he took him down there. Yeah. As he came up the drive, uh, Keith Haring said, "Oh, it's like something from the Adams family." I was going to say perhaps the Adams family. And uh, any, anyway, he loved it. Absolutely loved yeah. it. Went around and yeah. you know we showed him. I think we stayed the night there. Well, he he did a whole exhibition of paintings, yeah. and they were shown at the gallery. Yeah. But then he did these just off the top of his head, um, murals mm. around the Richmond Railway Station. And so you drive, if you're going up um, Chapel Street, you go under the railway bridge, mm. and as you go towards the city, it's on the left, there's a big chunk of concrete. That's right. And he painted this wonderful mural there, mm. and he turned one of the doorways into kind of like a, a sort of radiating, um, something radioactive. Mm with things coming off it and all these figures around mm. it. It was there for about two years and then one day I went past, the council had um, got rid of it. You wouldn't believe it. The sort of thing that happens with Banksy now. No, that's right. They just yeah. came and, you know, mm. and there were other ones that just disappeared as well. They were, you know, they were just things he did, single mm. figures. And he, he did a wonderful thing on the, the glass of the National Gallery as well. Mm. So the only major one that survived is the, the one at the Tech in Brunswick. That's mm. a great, that's a very, very, that's one of his best works. And they've restored it just recently, but it'd be good if they, I don't know what you could do with it. Because mm. it was painted on brick, I, mm. you know. Well, Fraser, um, yeah. for, for us, obviously, Andy Warhol is a, is a screen print, Elizabeth Taylor, a crash car, or, yeah. or Mick Jagger. And, and to think that, um, 
I asked you about that at the Christmas party yeah. and now we get this wonderful insight. So I really want to thank you uh, uh, on behalf of Leonard Joel and, and people that will enjoy this, this little you know, yeah. very yeah. personal insight into a time yeah. you spent with yeah. him. It's fascinating. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.